Every year, three million of us head to the Greek islands for our holidays. And it's easy to see why. This is Greece, and look at that. I have a strong affinity with the islands. My mum is Greek. But I've only holidayed here. Here we go. Until now. <laughs> so I'm going to explore their hidden side. Look, there's nobody here. Hello, everybody. Oh, you're good. From their breathtaking natural wonders. Let me show you our real mother. To the colorful customs and the architectural splendor. That is a miracle of loveliness. It makes me proud to be just that little bit Greek. This is a voyage of discovery, and I'm taking you with me. Rhodes, or Rhodos, as the Greeks call it, is often referred to as the island of the sun because it's said that Helios, the Greek god of the sun, chose this place to be his home. And it's sunny here for eight months of the year, so it's easy to see why. My journey has brought me to the Dodecanes, meaning 12. It's named after the 12 main islands which make up this far-flung archipelago. Located just 11 miles from the coast of Turkey, over 200 miles from mainland Greece, at the crossroads of Europe and the Orient, these islands are packed with history and culture. I'll be hopping to the lesser-known Simi, but first I'm starting here on the largest of the Dodecanese, in search of the real Rhodos. It's dripping in historical treasures, from crusader castles to frescoed churches. Just look at it. the oldest inhabited medieval city in the world. A stroll through its maze of alleyways reveals ancient reminders of its rich past. But it isn't a museum frozen in time. Look at this, somebody lives here, and you can't do this at home all year round, obviously, because you haven't got the weather. But here you can just leave your laundry. It smells so good, it's just so fresh and lovely. I bet it wasn't nearly as fragrant when Crusaders occupied Rhodos in the 14th century. Calimera. Who were an order of the Christian knights from across Europe. Their stronghold was the palace of the Grand Master. I know, quite a name, isn't it? But unlike the rest of the neighborhood, this fairy tale castle isn't nearly as old as you might think. In 1856, it was devastated by an explosion. A lightning bolt struck the powder store, and the place was levelled. 800 people lost their lives. By then, it was in the hands of the Turks, so maybe Zeus played a role. He was partial to a bit of lightning. During the Italian occupation in World War II, it was painstakingly rebuilt by Mussolini. But I'm leaving the tourist trail in search of another of the island's cultural delights. I'm meeting the local artist, Yorgos. Thank you. At the little-known ruined church of St John the Baptist. Oh, it's nice and cool in here. And stunning! Gosh, look at these wonderful ceilings. In here, you can catch a glimpse of a treasure trove of religious art created when Rhodos was ruled from the east by the Byzantine Empire in what's now modern-day Turkey. What are we looking at? We can see the whole trinity. The whole trinity in the Christian painting was painting with three angels, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. How old is this, Yorgo? Uh, this composition was painted on 60th century. Gosh, almost, 500 yes. years. And it's still here, it survived. It's amazing to find a little gem like this tucked away down a quiet side street. Yorgos is one of the few left in Greece who knows the secrets of the medieval art of fresco painting, and he runs classes teaching visitors. Into the gallery. I'm his next pupil. So what are we going to do in here now? We are going to make a fresco. Adam, in paradise, We're going to make only this part. After learning to paint wooden icons in an orthodox monastery, Yorgos studied frescoes in Italy, and since then, he's worked in churches all over Rhodos. Fill it, just completely fill it? Yeah, yeah, fill it. 
The technique we're using today dates back as far as the Bronze Age. Pigments made from natural minerals are mixed with water and painted directly onto wet plaster. Is this painful, you watching me do this to your... No, 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 I like it because you do it very well. Oh, good, OK. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's lovely. It's so lovely to watch. Look how straight he holds his fingers. Nice. Travelling along ancient trade routes, these colours are the exact colours that Byzantine artists used centuries ago. You want to make the leaves? Mm-hmm. Such a lovely colour. I'm not sure what they'd make of my efforts. Oh, I don't know what that is. That's like a random pomegranate morphed strawberry. One over Adam's head. A little temptation. The fruit hanging and all that jazz. Go on, Adam, take a bite, take a bite. But there we go. Okay, well done. <laughs> da da da! It is the icon of Adam as painted by Julia and Yorgo. Thank you, Yorgo. Efkaristopoli. <laughs> That's lovely. That was such an enjoyable experience. I can see why you like doing this. It's a nice way to spend your life. Around every corner are clues to the island's position on the historic trade route to the east. But I'm heading to the steep pine forests of the interior on the hunt for an exotic delicacy that Rodos is famous for. I'm going to meet some ladies now who are going to teach me all about an ancient Greek superfood. It's a rich, opulent, sweet and sticky treat. Yum. I've travelled 27 miles inland to the village of Apollona, where an unusual group of entrepreneurs is making melekouni, a unique Rhodian snack of honey and sesame seeds. Hello, Katerina. Hello, Hello. Hello. lovely to see you. Nice. So, ladies, I'm so excited to meet you because my little boy, Zephyrus, when he was in my tummy, I used to call him a sesame seed. Oh. So, we have all my favourite things here. <laughs> what I really love is they're all related. Mums and daughters, aunts and cousins, making what you could call an ancient Greek energy bar. You will find melekouni in the whole island. Yes. But our melekouni, I think it's the best. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'd like to help you, so can I do something with Yes, you? you may help us make melekouni. Fantastic. OK. Oh, I can see the sesames. OK. Spiced with aromatic cinnamon and nutmeg, traders brought sesame from India in the first century BC. Okay. So now we're so, going to put the honey in the okay, system. Can I do that? Yes. Okay, can. anywhere? And just, yes, and stir it tight. Right, okay. Start a little bit at a time. Mmm, -hmm. the smells. Traditionally given to newlyweds, the seeds represent the years of marriage. Oh, <laughs> you're good. Okay. <laughs> Local honey from the island's pine forests give Melakuni its unique flavour and apparently keeps the marriage sweet. There's another big selling point, too. <laughs> Hi, Vasilia. Hi. Hi. Oh, oh, look. This is, this is, a, anointed. This okay. is a tradition we do. OK. In, uh, when we make melekouni yes. in houses, the what? old time. <laughs> I've been honeyed. <laughs> a week before the wedding, we make melekouni. Yes. And everybody gets Get stuck this. with her honey, okay. so we have a nice face at the wedding. Because it's very good for you, the honey, isn't it? Very good for the skin and the complexion. Maybe that's the secret to all those happy marriages. Yeah. And so it's like pastry together, now. yes. Mm. Like that. Oh, it feels so good. <laughs> it feels so good. It smells so good. So what are we doing? Just flattening it? Yes. Making a thousand melakuni a day, skills passed on for centuries are giving financial independence to the latest generation of the village's women. So it's the melakuni moment of truth. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's still warm. Oh, it has to get... lovely. You can hear the honeybee. Mm. Oh, that's right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to spoil that now, so I'm going to taste this a little bit here. Here, look, I'm just going to... Mmm. 
Now I can see why this stuff has been around for so long. Oh, it's so delicious. <laughs> it's low calorie, yeah? Yeah, it's just honey and sesame. Yeah, it's just, just honey and nuts. <laughs> Not fattening at all. Ah, what's a few calories between friends? Next, I'm off to Simi, to a tiny island with a big history and a style all of its own. The Greek Islands with Julia Bradbury. Brought to you by Tui Tours. The Greek Islands with Julia Bradbury. Brought to you by Tui Tours. I've come to the Dodecanes, a remote group of Aegean islands closer to Turkey than the Greek mainland. After exploring Rhodos' rich cultural history as the gateway to the Middle East, I'm heading 41 kilometers away to neighboring Simi. And it's like nowhere else in Greece. I mean, really. Have you ever seen anywhere so beautiful? It reminds me of Portofino in Italy, but it's quite unique. It's like ferrying into some sort of opera set. The island was named after a nymph who stole the heart of Poseidon, god of the sea. Just seven miles by five, its rocky interior is largely uninhabited. And maybe more than any of the Dothakinis, Simi was shaped by its relationship with the ocean. Hidden among steep, winding streets away from the tourist haunts of the harbour, I've been told there's another less mythical sea creature I have to try. Simi shrimp. Simply fried in olive oil, these tiny crustaceans aren't found anywhere else in the world. Oh, it's lovely. Oh, it's lovely. Oh, yeah. The whole thing? Yes. Yes. Like chips. Like chips. Okay. Mm. Mm. Shrimp chips. They are supremely sweet. Yummy. Simi might be famous for its shrimp, but the grand neoclassical mansions, which make it so different from the rest of Greece, also owe their existence to the rich waters around the island. Author Yanis is an expert in a unique chapter in Simi's history. You must be Yanis. Hello, Julia. Hello. <laughs> nice Great to meet you. Great to meet you. you. How are you? Welcome Lovely to Simi. <laughs> oh, and what a delight when you step off the ferry and you see this for the first time. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it's breathtaking. Beautiful. Yep. Why does Simi look like this? Simi and the islands around here had the spunk diving fleet, and that was going on for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So they really became very, very wealthy. By the 19th century, sponges were used for everything, from taking a bath to padding soldiers' helmets. Growing in abundance under the sea here, tiny Simi became the centre of a huge global trade, one that relied on a unique skill learnt over centuries. Why were the people of Simi so good at freediving? The fathers and grandfathers taught it to, to their children and grandchildren to make an income for themselves. And, uh, of course, uh, they loved the sea because mm. it wasn't an easy life. For no, them. it sounds very romantic and it sounds yeah, it's uh, very, very adventurous, very hard. very hard, a very really hard. tough existence. A world-renowned expert in the modern discipline of freediving, Yanis has arranged for me to see how hard it is for myself. Calimera, hoppa, there we go. How are you? I'm OK. Good. Thank you, thank you. Yes, are you Ulysses? Hello. Hello, hello. Vasilis and his son Ulysses are giving me a crash course in how it was done here long before it became a competitive sport. How deep will we go? How long do you want? How, how, how long you, you want? <laughs> how deep will you go? Not very, not very. It's about 11, 12 metres. OK. It was quite deep to me, but anyway. 
Today, tourism is Simi's main industry, and the lucrative sponge trade, along with the huge wealth it brought with it, are just a memory. We know, sadly, the sponges are gone now. Yes, since 1960s, that was the last season for the sponge divers. Since then, we don't earn money from uh, sponges. Mm. It's a long history. In 1863, came in Simi the first scuba diving suit. Mm -hmm. And this was the suit with the big yeah, yeah, helmet. Yeah, 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 yeah. The this big one. goldfish bowl this helmet. <laughs> this yeah. one. It was a disaster. Mm. But also, the problem was that the scuba divers vacuum the dead. They clean, they take all of them, all of them. They overfished the sponges, they wiped out exactly. all of them. Exactly. Until then, the number of sponges collected was limited by how long a diver could hold his breath, armed only with a very basic bit of kit to help them reach the seabed. So, gentlemen, I'm in your hands. What happens first? Yep, you can see how the old fisherman redived with uh, the stone, with the marble. Oh, this next to you? This one. How heavy is that? This is about 10 kilos. You keep it, first of all, as a weight, and second, as a steering system. You keep the stone like this. Like a and, laptop? Yes, and you walk. And start walking. <laughs> and you walk. It's, it's very funny. <laughs> Let's go. Let's get in the water, Let's gents. Get. Look at this father and son. He's 15, Ulysses is 15, my little boy is eight. God, I'd love him to experience this kind of life. It's hard to imagine going for a leisurely stroll 12 meters underwater, but I've been told the trick is to breathe deeply, empty your mind, and stay calm. Watching Vasilis is fascinating because he's taking these deep breaths now. Look, he's perched on the back of the boat. He's breathing in, he's really focused. He's got the stone in front of him. It's a real moment. This would be considered a shallow dive, but oxygen leaves the blood fastest in the first 10 meters. So blacking out is still a very real risk. Thirty seconds already. One of the world's most primitive animals, there are over 6,000 types of sponge. Before overfishing, the rocky seabed and crystal clear water here was the perfect habitat for Simi's native species. Nearly a minute down there. And I think he definitely got to the bottom of the seabed. He's back in the boat. My turn, OK. It takes years of practice to walk on the seabed like Vasilis, so I'm just going to try and touch the bottom. Oh, hello. What's this? What is it? Yeah. Look at that. I've never had my sleeve blown up before. <laughs> I'm smiling, but the nerves are starting to kick in. So before I get in the boat, yeah. what's it like down there? How was that? Always fantastic. Yes? You will see. You will I see. will see. I will, I will see if I'll see. How far down do you think I'll get? It's free diving, so don't care about depth. Ready? Yep, ready. Steady. Steady. I've done a bit of diving and snorkeling before, but I've never tried anything like this. What is the aim for me here today now? What is going to make this different to me when I sort of try to get down to the bottom of the seabed in a shallow bit of water when I'm on holiday. It's like you return in your mother. To the womb? Yes. Back to the womb. She is our, our mother. OK. But the feeling is strong. OK. Uh -huh. There's no going back now. 
but I have Yanis in the water with me just in case anything goes wrong. It really isn't as easy as Vasilis makes it look. Ah. I couldn't get down. My ears were going... But I'm not ready to give up. So there's a black sponge down there. I need to keep breathing, get myself calm and try just to pop down to it. I can't believe I did it. So I made it to the black sponge. I touched it. My ears <laughs> popping like crazy. Yeah. But it is beautiful. My time in the Dodecanese is coming to an end. But the places I've seen and the people I've met will leave me with memories as rich as the history of these incredible islands. And that moment as you come up, because the buoyancy is just like whooshing you, through the water and you see the light above you and it's just magic, that, that feeling when you go poof, and you just explode on the surface. Oh, but that was a special experience. Simi's a pretty special place. Next time, the final leg of my Greek odyssey takes me to Chios the island where my own story began. It's strange being here because this island is a part of us. It's a part of our family. Absolutely. I'll be taking my mum on an emotional journey into our past. So what do you think of the house? Um... Unearthing magical customs and colorful traditions, unchanged for generations. Oh, here he goes. Julia Bradbury, brought to you by Tui Tours.